title of the sermon this morning, Pleasing Our Lord, Not People. The sermon text is found in Matthew chapter 6. I'll begin reading with verse 1 and go through verse 18. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be, have glory from men, and assuredly I say to you that they have the reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and deliver and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we know as we come to you this morning that indeed you are present with us by your Holy Spirit. Everything is open and laid bare before you, before your holy gaze. And so we do not lift up unclean hands unto you, but in confession and in repentance we come to you, Father, admitting, owning the sin which so easily besets us, the sins of heart and of mind, the affections not set on the things above, but on the things below, the mind that has not brought every thought captive to obedience to Christ, the deeds that are incomplete and are failing to rise up to the standards you have set in your commands. Lips that are so easily used to tear down when they should be used to edify and be seasoned with grace. But Father, we come to you in the name and righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who satisfied for everything in our behalf and is our advocate at your right hand even now, interceding in our behalf. And so, Father, may you watch over your word to perform it here this morning. May you cause your word to go forth in such a fashion that it would change us from the inside out. And we indeed would be as those who you would call to follow Christ in purity and truth and, and sincerity of faith and heart, not as those who wear the mask of a hypocrite, and so, Father, as we open this text before us, we pray that you indeed would be the one who actually does, and that you would speak to us not just in our ears, but also in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, the title of the sermon, Pleasing Our Lord, Not People. There are three things I would like to deal with. The uh, Lord's Prayer, we've dealt, if you'll recall, we dealt with that uh, previously, 
uh, several weeks ago. But now we return and look at these three things the Lord points out. Uh, first of all, the idea of giving alms or charitable deeds. Secondly, the things such as prayer. And then finally, fasting. And so let us consider the first item on the agenda, verses 1 through 4, charitable deeds unto the Lord. Charitable deeds unto the Lord. He says here that we are to do these, or actually the phrase that's used here in verse 1, uh, in most translations they have it correctly, do not do our righteousness before men, to be seen of men. And so here the call is certainly unto righteousness. Now this is speaking, as you'll remember, as we went through to this point, starting with the Beatitudes and moving forward about the gospel of the kingdom, that these are admonitions, exhortations, instructions for those who are already believers in Jesus Christ, for those who have the life of the gospel of heaven in us even now, of those who are following our Lord. And so as it describes this, this is the life of the Christian, of the believer. And this is what is to be exhibited in this body unto his glory. <clears throat> these are the fruits of his grace at work in us. And so it says our charitable deeds. And obviously these charitable deeds are the aspect of giving unto those who are in need. Considering those who are in need of help, monetary, physical aid being given, un given unto them. <clears throat> and so first of all, as it makes clear here, he says in verse 1, it's not to be done to be seen of men. In other words, that we're doing it as to, as one were an actor playing unto an audience, playing a role, which fits well with what a hypocrite really is. And furthermore, not to be glorified or praised by other people, praised by men, as it would describe here. Now, as you look in uh, various parts of Scripture, as you consider, uh, for example, John 12, 43, the Lord talked about Pharisees and scribes who uh, preferred the praise of men rather than the praise of God. Well, that's precisely what's taking place here of those, when we react this way, or maybe it's not given that much thought, but it ought to be now, doing things to receive, for example, applause from an audience, doing it to be, to have uh, the attention, seeking the attention, or doing uh, that which we're doing uh, in giving something to, to have other people notice and think highly of us. All of that is the same thing as seeking the praise of men. The Lord puts it in stark contrast. He says, these are they who, who desire the praise of men more than the praise of God. A very critical thing indeed. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, many of us know that verse. It says that whatever we do there, it says we're to do all things there for the glory of God. So he's to receive the glory, the praise. We're not to seek to rob it or to crowd into the glory that's to him, but instead as we give, it is without a thought of people exalting us for it, but all the praise must be unto our Lord. And so he makes the point here in verse two, not like the hypocrites in the synagogues. Now the hypocrites would be those who would sound a horn. I'm not certain they would actually sound blow a horn, uh, perhaps, I, I'm not certain of that part, but I do know the Lord means to draw attention to themselves, say, look at me, I'm giving. You know, Jesus talks about uh, <clears throat> the almsgiving of, a, of a people in the synagogue as he was watching them walk out and put their alms in the offering box. And he talks about those that give out of their abundance and they make sure they they used all coinage in that day, of course, that they had, not paper uh, money by any means. And they want to be sure and drop it from a high position so all can see, and it makes lots of noise. Everyone recognizes what they've given, and they give out of their abundance, so everyone thinks them generous. But Jesus watched a little woman who was a widow, and she pulled out her two little mites, 
uh, little copper coins that were the smallest of coins, really. And she put those two coins in the offering. And Jesus made the uh, point to his disciples. He said, this woman gave more than all the rest. They gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her poverty. Indeed, she gave all that she had. Well, you see, the Lord, he is the one who's watching. He recognizes. Don't look around. We are not to look around to the others in the church, others in the synagogue, others around us to have their accolades and recognition. So not to be done for this to be seen of men. The Lord calls these people hypocrites who do that. Now, the word hypocrite, as many of you know, is the word that... Uh, is used for the mask that the actors would use in the ancient world. At least the Greeks would use it, the Romans as well. And so these were all familiar with the word. The word hypocrites was the, the mask they would wear, the smile or the frown. You would simply hold that mask up in front of your face. It, it wasn't real, it was portraying just simply what the role required. They were actors, pretenders. The Lord says, don't be holding up masks. Don't be a pretender. Don't be those who are doing it for the audience of the other people. And so the Lord says the hypocrites do these things. Now, what is hypocrisy about? And what is the Lord makes a big thing about hypocrisy. And uh, well, if we think of hypocrisy, first of all, remember why one is to give. Remember the scripture says we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. So in other words, it is in obedience to that second summary of the law, loving our neighbor as ourselves. And so it is to be done out of love for God, first of all, and love for them, our neighbor. We talked about neighbors last time uh, in this uh, text, previous verses, where it talks about not to loving our neighbor, not to hate our enemies. And so the neighbors are all those. All of those around us are fellow, fellow human beings. And so love for them and their welfare should be the motivation. But instead it's, if you think about it, the way Jesus puts it, they're wanting the, the, the accolades of others. They want to be recognized. That's pride. That's self-exaltation. A self-centered approach to giving. Not love for neighbor, but love for self. It's what is motivating it when it's hypocritical. In fact, doing it that way is in no way righteousness. Remember, do your righteousness uh, unto the Lord. So that is in no way righteous. Why? Well, the motive is wrong, first of all. The foundation is built on, the motive is skewed. It's for self-aggrandizement, self-pride self-recognition. Furthermore, the circumstances of the deed. The circumstances are that one is doing it to, as they give these things unto those who are needy. It is for everyone around them playing to that audience rather than the circumstances being in private to help. And furthermore, the results. The results are not the glory to God. The results are not truly loving the neighbor. The neighbor is not, well, not loved really. But the results are merely the accolades that the person has received, the praise the giver has received. Well, it's obvious here, no righteousness and self-centeredness pride have poisoned the well, so to speak. And uh, it's to be done for good, though, isn't it? How are we to give? How should we do it? What does the Lord want us to do? Well, first of all, in verse 1, Backing up to verse 1, he says, do not, do not do these these works of righteousness before men to be seen, otherwise no reward from your Father. So we are to do it just as the Father would have us to do it. In other words, for righteousness sake. Do it because God is pleased with this. We're to do it because we ought to fulfill righteousness for his namesake. Furthermore, we should do it in faith. We should do it in faith knowing that this is that which is truly unto a God who's there. He sees. We see the, the other humans, but faith says we believe in the invisible God, and he sees. Faith, and we're to do it in love. A love for that person that has need, and love unto our Lord, 
who is with us even by his spirit. And moreover, it is truly, as we say, love for neighbor. Let me read a verse that's over in 1 John, which talks a lot about love uh, that one should have for the brethren. And in uh, 1 John uh, chapter 3, uh, verses uh, 17 and 18, it says this, Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Notice what it says. If we shut up our heart, we're not truly showing love for God either. And so here, how are we to do it? Well, truly out of love for our neighbor but also as unto the Lord. We are to give as unto the Lord. You know, in Hebrews 13, I think it's verse 16, it talks about offering spiritual sacrifices. In one verse, it talks about a sacrifice of praise, but here it says, doing these charitable deeds, these good deeds, are God is well pleased with such spiritual sacrifices. And so a, a thing that's very pleasing unto God and uh, another passage that uh, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, if I can find it very quickly, uh, there the apostle is talking about these, these sorts of things of, of helping those who are in need. <clears throat> and in chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, verses 12 and 13, he writes, he writes this. He says, truly... Um, I apologize, I've gotten the wrong, I've gotten the wrong reference there. Well, I'll find it in a moment, give me a moment. Yes. He talks about the service, supply needs is a service under the saints. And he says that we should abound through many of these things in thanksgiving to God. And so while through the proof of this ministry, they are glorifying God for your obedience unto the Lord and your liberal sharing with them and with all men. And so you see here, those who are receiving are glorifying God, but we're doing it for the Lord, as a service unto the Lord. The word service there is very closely related to that word worship. And so it is, as it were, an act of worship unto God that we should help our brothers and sisters in need. And so the, the concept here, that's how we rightfully do uh, our giving. It is, um, well, as remember in, in Matthew 25, there the Lord's talking about at his return, at the second coming of Christ. He talks about he'll have the people dividing them, sheep from goats, you know, those who would be his would be the sheep, <clears throat> and those who are, go are the goats are the ones who are not believers. And he, he talks about uh, those, he says, brother, they're the sheep, he says, come into this uh, blessing of the Lord. And he says, for I was hungry, and you fed me, I was I was uh, needing drink, or needing drink, and you gave me drink. I was needing to be visited. You visited me, etc. And the question is, Lord, when did I see you hungry, or naked, or thirsty? And it's interesting what Jesus says. He says, "Inasmuch as you did it unto these, the least of my brethren, you did it unto me." Well, beloved, you see, that's how we're worshiping God by helping others, by giving to others. You see, it is that we are actually worshiping or serving our Lord, as it were, by giving. This generosity, this kind of a giving heart, is one that has a real concern for those who are in need, who are suffering the, the lack of, of things that are necessary. Boaz, remember him? In the book of uh, Ruth, remember Boaz was very concerned. He, 
he saw these women who were trying to gather up a Ruth and her mother-in-law, uh, just a little food out of the fields, and he instructed his harvesters, he said, look, leave extra for them. The law said to leave the corners of your field uh, for the gleaners to take their share. But he said, start dropping extra parts for them to pick up to make it easy on them. A concern for those who are in need. That's the love. That's why we ought to give. We ought to have a real love and compassion for those who are in need. And it should be a love and, com and a service unto our Lord that he might be receiving the glory. There's another thing. It is the idea of recalling that everything we have is a gift from God. Scripture says, what do you have that you've not received? Well, we know that all is of grace, don't we? Of God's common grace, certainly everyone receives, but also believers, we have his special grace. Well, grace is that we've received not only what we don't deserve, but we receive the opposite of what we deserve. And so the Lord says that it's all of grace, then we should show our gratitude for that grace, our appreciation for what we receive. And when, once we show that, the more we show that appreciation, the more we'll want to give to others. That's the idea. And finally, it's a matter of stewardship, isn't it, in providence? S stewardship, first of all, God's entrusted this to, into our hands to distribute, to use, to, to apply in a way that's most honoring and glorifying and, unto him and serving him, not us. And so it's a sacred trust for a time to use as a master would have us to do. And in providence, because God set us in, in certain circumstances that we might be used by him to please him. That's the appropriate view of the whole thing. And so our charitable deeds should be as unto the Lord. But I hasten to my second point, prayer to our holy heavenly Father. Prayer to our holy heavenly Father. And really, this is verses five through eight. As I said, the Lord's Prayer itself we've, we've covered, but this is the rationale leading up to it. How to do this in a way that's pleasing to the Lord, not pleasing people. Well, as the Lord says, when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. So the Lord uh, here is addressing the same problem and illustrating hypocrisy once again, but this time with regard to prayer. Well, uh, as the Lord deals with this, it, he says uh, in the next verse, verse six, he says that you should enter into your room and close the door. And he says, your father who sees in the secret place, your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. These, a hypocrite loves to pray long prayers. And we'll get to a mo in a moment about what is in the prayer. But they love to pray to be seen of other people. I want to stand up in the synagogue, everyone look at me and listen to me as I pray before you all. Or on the street corners for people to see them praying on the street corner. Well, beloved, as the Lord would describe it here, he says to do instead just the opposite. Entering into, entering into prayer in our Lord, with our Lord in secret. That's not to say there are no public prayers. Of course, there are prayers included in the public worship of the Lord that are public. But public prayer should not be seen as the goal and as a replacement for the secret place spent in prayer. I think our best illustration of this is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, don't you? Remember the Lord Jesus did pray in public, but not often, and not long prayers. But he did pray whole nights, constantly, frequently, in private. He would seek a, a, a desolate, lonely place. He would even depart from his own disciples many times to pray to the Father, and we'll come to why in a moment. 
but just to get to the point of the idea of praying in secret with the Father. Well, I will come to it. The Lord who is in, Father who is in the secret place. He would, if anyone you would think would not need to pray, it would be God the Son incarnate. And yet he needed constant prayer. Why? Because the fundamental need was communion with God the Father and God the Spirit. Communion with him. This shared love and experience and union and the love being the, a principal thing in this bond that they, of the Holy Trinity. Well, you and I, as we pray, you see, it should be that communion we desire with God himself, not with others, per se, that's ultimately driving us. And so, uh, furthermore, here you see the Lord gives us admonitions about this kind of prayer. It is uh, uh, in uh, verse 6, he said in private, but in verse 7, when you pray, not with vain repetitions as the heathen do. They think for many repetitions, many words, they will be heard. And so the point here being vain repetitions. Their, their verbiage, first of all, is chosen to impress. Choosing the words to impress people. Rather than simply put to commune or to pray unto our Father. Also, the idea here is of vain repetitions and, and many words. Uh, I think also of, of uh, praying not from the heart, not with understanding, not unto uh, our Lord from the innermost being, but rather praying uh, others, other people's prayers, for example. Like a prayer book that you're using of someone else's. We're praying someone else's prayers. Uh, you know, often used like in liturgies, for example, uh, or memorized formulae. You have a memorized formula. And so as you memorize the formula and we repeat the formula, like, uh, um, well, like someone who's uh, pray, praying the rosary or uh, someone who is uh, doing like a mantra or a chant on, to the Lord or, or even doing things that are just many words like or many sounds like speaking in tongues, all of which the Lord says, no, that's not what honors me. Many words, meaningless and mindless quantity, thinking that quantity is all that matters. And by the way, the Lord makes the point here, many words is not the cause of his hearing our prayers. That's not the cause. And so here, as you put it, go into these matters, the Lord makes it clear really fundamentally, if it's not worship, it's not real. It's not really showing faith. It should be a humble worship. Worship is, is bowing unto our Lord. Worship is, a, a, oh, by the way, the word uh, uh, proskuneo, which is the word that's used here, uh, is, um, or word for worship, is the idea of bowing down or falling down before him. And so when we think here of many words, if it's not worship, it's not real, it's not bowing unto him. And worship is humble, selfless, and consumed with him, not to be seen by other people, not to be caught up in traditions, but to be caught up in him. And so when you think here in verse nine, it says, pray in this way, our Father who is in heaven. Now, our Father who is in heaven, there's where we go. In verse eight, it says, do not be like them that your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. And so we're praying to our father. We're not informing him of our experience. We're not informing him of our needs. That's not ultimately what's taking place, is it? Or we, we realize our needs, our experience, our heart indeed is known by him. The Lord says, for example, Revelation 2.23, the Lord says that he is the one, our Lord Christ, is, who judges the secrets of the hearts of men. So he knows us. So it's not to, to inform him our Lord is omniscient. Our Lord is infinite in wisdom too, knowing exactly what it is we need. And so we are not to think that we can bind or loose or, 
or move his hand. This is a sovereign, omnipotent God we come to. But it's also, as I've pointed out here, <clears throat> it's faith pointing to the Holy Trinity away from self, but looking away from ourselves to him. We're in utter, absolute dependence upon him, need. We don't bring anything but our need to the equation and our position in Christ, our only hope, our only foundation, our only mediator. But notice it says, come to the Father. He brings that personal relationship we have. Remember, in Christ, as many as believe in him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. We have the Holy Spirit within. Remember, the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. And so prayer is one that's communing with our Heavenly Father. Think of it. It's our Heavenly Father connecting us on, to us on earth. It is God with us as men and women. It is uh, us in our flesh connecting with God, the Holy Spirit. We have father and child relationship. We have the son with those who are in union with him, his redeemed. We have the spirit who is within us causing the spirit of a devotion. And so we enter into that mutual love fellowship that is within the Holy Trinity itself because we come to our father in Christ indwelt by the spirit and so we are drawn into that communion. Oh, beloved, that's what prayer is ultimately about. How can you do that if you're putting on a show? If it's to be done a scene of men, you can see, and I'm going to point out some horrible things about why hypocrisy is horrible in that sense, but here's the obvious one. The obvious one is we are abandoning the true worship and prayer to God and, and sacrificing such a fellowship with him for the mere temporary earthly accolades that are hollow and in, insincere anyway from fellow creatures with feet of clay. Oh, like, like uh, Esau trading his birthright for a bowl of stew. What a poor trade it is. And so when you think of this, beloved, it is just the opposite of pride and self-elevation. Look at verse 9 and 10 with me. In this manner, pray our Father who is in heaven, holy, hallowed is thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice we are bowing before the King of Kings <clears throat> and acknowledging abandoning all pride and self-elevation, the opposite of prayer. It is a holy sovereign. It's God, our creator. He made us. What is the right that he has for us to come to him and worship? Simply put, first of all, because we're his creatures. And he's our father. And he redeemed us by his grace. All of that put together. Oh, he has every right. And so we come to him as our sustainer and redeemer and judge. He's all those things. Hallowed be thy name. Holy means set apart and revered reverence. The opposite of pride. It's an act of humble, dependent worship. If it's not, then it's a vile insult to God. It, we have just defiled that which is holy prayer. And by the way, the Lord does not honor that at all. In Isaiah chapter 57, I think it's verse 15, the Lord says, I am the one who is high and lifted up. And he says, but I dwell also with the humble and contrite in spirit. James 4 talks about the, the Lord resists the proud. He stiff arms the proud, holds them away but he gives grace to the humble. And so when we're talking here about that which honors God, 
truly, he says, in our prayer, in our charitable deeds, it is to be that which is honoring unto him, not us. But in the third place, fasting. Fasting over sin and in repentance. Fasting over sin in repentance. These are the verses 6 through 8. Or excuse me. Uh, these are the verses uh, 16 through 18. Over when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. They disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. Well, everything that was said about hypocrisy before can be repeated here. It is uh, the hypocrite that's doing things to be seen of other people, to be receive the glory of themselves. It is the mask of an imposter. And it is the Lord calling us to a sincere faith. In Hebrews 10, it says, come into the holiest of all by a new and living way, that is by the blood of Jesus Christ, through the veil that is the veil of his flesh, whereby we enter in, in him our mediator. But it says we are to come with sincerity of heart, full assurance of faith. And so there we are to come in that way, or not at all. Blessed are those who mourn. Remember the Lord said that in the Beatitudes. So as we see here fasting, what is fasting? about anyway. If you were to go through the Old Testament, uh, I'll give you some examples that help us understand what it was about. In Nehemiah chapter 9, remember in Nehemiah what had happened was the children of Israel had been taken away into captivity, into exile. Uh, in 586 BC was the final uh, invasion by Nebuchadnezzar, the third one where he just destroyed the temple, destroyed the city, and carried every way, everyone away captive to Babylon. Well, Babylon was itself conquered ultimately by Persia. And under the Persian king, Cyrus, uh, they were released to come back to rebuild the temple and even to rebuild the walls eventually. Well, as they did, Nehemiah, remember the first time they came back with uh, a Zerubbabel at the, at the lead, remember, and uh, uh, Ezra was involved. Uh, you had uh, the people coming back and they were zealous about working, but there were problems. And so Nehemiah came back uh, later on, years later, to complete the project, to get people to get back on the work and to complete the project. Well, when he did come back to the land, he had discovered many of the people had intermarried with the unbelievers, intermarried with the uh, those people who are around them that were pagans. And he was, he's, he reminded them, he says, do you forget that uh, this is why we were sent into exile in part? That we had absorbed the sinful uh, activities of those around us. We have intermarried with those around us, etc. And so in that passage in Nehemiah, back in chapter 8 of Nehemiah, you'll find that uh, uh, after they'd returned from exile and before this event in Nehemiah, Ezra was reading the law. All the people were gathered together and Ezra read the law to them. It says from morning until midday, all the people, the families were there. They read the law and they read all of God's warnings he had given to Israel when they first came into the land. Now understand, this is, this is something that had taken place 900 years prior. The Lord had warned them, if you do these things, I'm going to send you away as captives into another one and sweep the land clean of you. He had sent his prophets over the centuries to remind them, to call them to repentance. And finally, ultimately, God said enough and he sent them away and he brought back a remnant. And now the remnants repeating the same sinful process. And so as, as Ezra's reading the law, they all start to weep and wail because they had broken everything and they recognized it now. The word of God had smitten their conscience and broken their heart. And so in chapter nine, 
they declare a fast. They fasted and they put dust on their head. Why? Because of the sorrow and the shame uh, for their sin. It was powerful. It had smitten them to the very core of their being. And they were doing this in confession, confession of their sin. They were owning it. When you confess, you agree with the Lord about it, but you don't just agree in a flippant or shallow way, but you say, Lord, against you have I sinned, owning this reality and repentance, turning from this unto the living God and a transformed heart and mind in faith in the true God that he would forgive. That's what all of that was recognizing when we talk about fasting, they were fasting because of the law that they had broken. By the way, much of what's pointed out, like in the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, and other places, Ezekiel, was Israel's hypocrisy. It was the very hypocrisy that was anathema to God. Another example will suffice in Ezra chapter 4. Remember in the previous chapter of, of excuse me, Esther 3, yes. In Esther 3, remember the, the trickery that you had occur. Haman had tricked the, the king, and so there was a law signed in, <clears throat> the law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be broken, that all of the Jews would be annihilated. At this time, uh, Ahasuerus did not know that Esther was Jewish. And so here Mordecai is outside the gate. He's ripped his clothes and he's put on sackcloth and put ashes on his head and he's weeping and wailing at the gate of the city. And all of Israel was weeping and wailing and, and fasting before God. What was the fasting about? It was about repentance. It was about sorrow over sin. It was in despair before God saying, I'm unworthy, Lord, pity us. That's what... Fasting is supposed to be about. The Psalm 35, 13 puts it this way. I humbled myself with fasting. And in the next verse, I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. Now that's what fasting is supposed to be like. We come back to our text here in Matthew 6. It says they're fasting. All they're doing is they're, they're just not, shop, they're not uh, washing themselves because they want everyone around them to see them as fasting. They put ashes on their head so everyone will see that they're fasting. And so they were, uh, their act meant, was supposed to mean humility. Instead, it was becoming a sign of pride. A sign of pride. In fact, uh, furthermore, it was a, uh, a sign that sin was being confessed of and repented of. And instead it was a means for self-righteousness and uh, uh, of works righteousness that was uh, supposed to be recognized by those uh, around them. If you were to read um, in the scriptures about uh, the, uh, uh, remember the prayer, the Lord talks about a prayer of a Pharisee. There's a publican or a tax collector that comes in and he prays unto the Lord. And uh, the tax collector says, Lord, I've, I've sinned. I'm unworthy uh, of anything, you know, to, uh, to be received from you. And then there's the Pharisee that comes into the temple at the same time. And the Pharisee prays and he starts talking about everything he's done. Lord, I thank you that uh, I'm not like this publican. Uh, for I do my charitable deeds, I, I uh, uh, tithe of, of all things, and I fast two times a week. So as you look at everything that occurs with this man as he, as he starts to pray, it's anything but a prayer. It is self-praise, self self-righteousness, and even putting down other people who don't match up to him. He fasts twice a week. What was the purpose of the fast? Obviously that he was showing himself to be one of the elite. He was better than the others. 
by doing this fasting. He was recognized by other Pharisees by doing these two times a week that he was better than the other people. He was a cut above. You know, thirdly, when you think about putting ashes on oneself, the ash was supposed to represent that you too were someone who was merely of the earth. Remember the scripture says that Adam was made of the dust of the earth. In Psalm 103, we too, Lord, are those who are merely with feet of clay. And you have pity on us because you know we are but dust. That was to recognize that. And, and so this ashes of dust where we're, we're all the Lord's creatures, equality of the people is God's creatures. Instead, elitism was that which was sought. And so I'm not like other men because I twice, I twice a week fast. It was just the opposite. And so as we look at some summary of all three of these instances the Lord gives us, what can we learn about hypocrisy and what the Lord would have? Well, fundamentally, what's at, what's at heart here? All three forms of hypocrisy, whether it's the giving to the others or to prayer or to fasting, it takes that which is meant to be holy unto the Lord, a service unto him, and it distorts it and defiles it until it becomes unholy. It takes a self and, and it turns self-recognition and self-praise as to be the ultimate goal. That's an idol set up that replaces God, myself. Moreover, it's dishonest. All the while, as one is praying or one is, is giving to other people or one is fasting, it's dishonest, it's a lie, claiming that it's for the Lord, where in reality, it's for oneself. You know, we can't fool the Lord. Scripture says, man looks upon the outside, but God looks upon the heart. And so we're fooling ourselves, actually, if we think we can do that, fool him. Moreover, another problem is that it, it causes stumbling blocks for other people who are watching. It is a, a doubt is sown, you could say, among those who are watching what Christianity is all about, watching Christians. It casts a shadow. How many times have you heard people say, oh, Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites, when one is like this, proving the hypocrisy that is within the church. And furthermore, it's really the mindset and the motives of an unbeliever. This is the way an unbeliever, uh, or the mindset anyway, is an unbeliever. What are we putting our minds on here? But things that are of people, fellow creatures, things of this earth, things of this short time. In John chapter 5, Verse 44, the Lord says, How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? The Lord asks the question, How can you believe if that's what's going on? From the lips of Jesus himself. The unbeliever's mindset, why? Well, first of all, because it's not that the heavenly direction or the eternal things are directing us, but it's all that is of this world, this life. You know, the, the fundamental idea or, or definition of the word secular is uh, rooted in that Latin term seculum. It means for this age or for this life. That's why the Lord says, you have your reward. And so that's a secular mindset, really. And so the Lord admonishes us to not be there. Moreover, you think of giving in this light, okay? I give, or these hypocrites give, in order to get. It's for my benefit. That's the true goal. I get the praises of other people. Or pray praying to receive, actually, from other people, 
their recognition and their praise, their adoration, their recognition, what have you, not to receive from God. Or if I do pray, I think my using certain formulae or much, many words will cause God to give, give me what I want, which is itself the prayers self-centered instead of God's glory centered. Or how about fasting? Fasting to impress the elites. And so with their tradition, seeking to impress the elites by using and fitting in and showing myself to or ourselves to be uh, exalting in their traditions of men. Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me for they elevate the traditions of men over the worship of God. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, the Lord tells us. Remember the Pharisees and the scribes were the ones Jesus was setting up. But there have been these types of people throughout all time. You know, there's something else I might bring up. Hypocrisy like this Okay, looking for other people's recognition or praise. What about times of persecution? This is why persecution purifies the church. Well, obviously, if you're doing it only to get ahead in religion, well, you just chosen that profession or that segment of life to get ahead or get praise or to have recognition. Well, what if that praise suddenly has turned to scoffing and going on from scoffing to, to contradiction and controversy? What if it's costly discipleship? Not one that's in it for you, but following him even unto the death. You see, the hypocrites will fall away. And uh, so we are called to follow the Lord in sincerity of heart and trueness of faith. You know, the Lord's addressing here, chapter 5, verse 20, remember, the Lord talks about, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So only those who are exceeding the Pharisees or the scribes, distortions that the Lord is recounting here, distortions and self-service acts that are so-called righteousness, unless we exceed that in faithfully resting in the righteousness of Christ, in those who, who have the heart, the heart of one who fasts, not one who puts ashes in the shape of a cross on their forehead for everybody to look at them and think they're so godly. But those who the Lord says, don't tear your garments, tear your heart before me. Well, as believers, we are truly brokenhearted over sin, who are truly loving our neighbor as those who are fellows and recipients of grace, or just other creatures of God who are in desperate need that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, and so we love them and desire to help. You see, this, these are the footsteps of Christ as disciples we are to follow. May God grant us the grace, and it's only by his grace that we can. May God grant us the grace for it. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we have covered these three sections in Matthew, we recognize that how offensive it is to you to be those who do things to be praised of other people, recognized by others and not to glorify you and you alone, not out of love for you and love for our brothers, but out of love for oneself. Of not doing these things, Father, as the true meaning of it, of communion with you in prayer, of real repentance and sorrow over sin and in fasting, of giving, Lord, as giving unto you, but instead twist it and turn it to where it becomes defiled and poisoned and dishonoring to you by the hypocrisy. 
Oh Lord, we know you're very great in honor and majesty. You are the one, Lord, who covers yourself with light as a garment. You're the one who stretched out the heavens like a curtain and you laid the beams of the chambers and the waters, your word tells us. And yet, Father, for all your greatness, as the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity and his name is holy, you dwell in the high and holy place, but also with him who is of contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Oh, Lord, our loving Father, your glory is beyond all praising. Your majesty leaves us speechless. We can neither truly fathom your greatness, Father, nor adequately praise it, and yet we do humble ourselves before you and lift up our hearts and minds and words unto you and say, Be thou exalted, O Lord. Thank you for your free, great grace. May we honor and please you, Father, as a spiritual sacrifice unto you in all things. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray it.